Deepika. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on again. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you for having me again. This is such a pleasure. I know. And you know what I was thinking about? It's just like, because you were on the podcast in our first season when we first started out. And by the way, we had an amazing conversation then. You guys, you should check it out. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. But I was just thinking about how, wow, the progress that the sh- or the evolution that the show has made, because it's like we started over here and now we're over here. And it's kind of cool to think about that, you know? Yes, including a name change, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Yes, which by the way, you guys, Kartika was integ- integral, integral in helping me coming up with the name that we have right now uh, for the podcast. So she's awesome in, in more than one way. Uh, but there's some interesting things coming coming in that realm too next season. I won't get into that much right now, but stay tuned for more surprises, I would say. <laughs> Um, but I'm excited I'm really excited to talk to you Um, I know you know we always have amazing conversations on and off screen and so uh, I'm just really honored uh, that that you're back with us today so welcome thank you thank you for having me again it's truly an honor Awesome. Um, So I want to start with um, your recent story for Vogue magazine named uh, how one of the smallest tribal nations in the U.S. is redefining sustainable living. It is such a beautiful story and it's so beautifully shot, by the way. The images are just beautiful, just absolutely like the way you've portrayed these women it was breathtaking. So I, I definitely encourage our listeners to also go check out the story. We're going to sh- uh, link to it in the show notes. Um, but tell me, what do you love about this story? <laughs> uh, all of it. Um, mm-hmm. It was just an unbe- unbelievable experience from the start to the finish. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of elements to this story. Um, so I actually met these women about a year ago, I was on a, on a fam trip with Visit California. They were just launching their Visit Native California, which is an incredible endeavor um, because they're focusing on indigenous and uh, communities and, and tourism from an indigenous lens, right? So um, we met these women for dinner. Mm-hmm. And um, they just, something about them, just like their presence, they are, you know, we were, we were sitting at a long table. I was sitting across with a couple of the, the women that I've eventually went on to like meet and, and interview. And just, you know, it was, they, they're one of the smallest tribal nations. They are, I think they're like seven adults um, and like 12 children. So total, you know, under 20. Um, wow. They have over a square, um, one square mile. Um, of in terms of like reservation land, mm-hmm. but they had some incredible, small but incredible and impactful programs that they were working on to become mm-hmm. sustainable, to become self-sustainable, I should say, um, mm-hmm. to get more control over you know their lives, their their reservation, just everything that they wanted to kind of do for themselves. Um, and the story was that you know they are. At one point, their mom um, was the only living adult Mm. who was managing this entire reservation. And then she called, you know, she had some health issues and she eventually, you know, passed away because of those health issues. And so the the two girls came in, um, the chairwoman, Amanda, who then called up her cousins and said, hey, I can't do this by myself. You guys have to come. So it's like they all the kids sort of moved away. Mm-hmm. And then all the kids kind of came back together um, to build this this community, this endeavor, right? So for me, that was very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a lot of sort of similarities in, um, you know, I lost my mom too to breast mm-hmm. cancer. And, um, you know, she was a very strong influence in my life. And um, a lot of my journey after she passed also kind of morphed where I kind of, you know, took a step back and then I kind of got myself together, looked at other skills and, you know, I'm kind of doing what I'm doing now. So I attribute a lot of that to my journey with my mom. Mm-hmm. And so seeing that with them, I don't know, maybe it was like some, you know, totally like internal, just what I felt, but I really was very compelled to tell the story. Um, mm-hmm. And I... <laughs> I pitched it and I pitched it and I pitched it. And every time I would hear that, oh, that's nice, but no, 
you know, or I would not get a response, which is very typical in our industry, right? Um, and then when I pitched it to, I don't know, just something about Vogue, sort of, um, especially the Earth to Us section, which they talk mm-hmm. about some of these, you know, smaller communities and individuals mm-hmm. um, who are making a huge difference. And, it, you know, maybe in the grand scheme of things, it's not big, for, but for what they are doing and the communities that, are, that they are impacting, it's monumental. So mm-hmm. I kind of took, again, a leap of faith and I pitched it to Vogue, never imagining that, you know, that would be get picked up like a few months later. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the editor was like, hey, you know, this is this is a great story. It will be really powerful if we can get imagery um, that kind of goes with the story. And I was like, you know, <laughs> <I'm> a photographer. <laughs> can I? You know, because it's it's always such a great feeling when you photograph and you write. And it's mm-hmm. like a whole a holistic view, right? Versus trying to fit the narrative to the images or fit the images to the narrative. I'm not mm-hmm. saying one way is right, one way is wrong. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really, again, I was so passionate about this story. I wanted to have my feet in or my hands in every aspect of it. Um, and so he was like, yeah, sure. If you want to, go ahead. <laughs> um, so that was that was one hurdle, um, mm-hmm. actually getting it accepted and then getting you know the, the commission even to photograph. My next hurdle was the fact that I literally had a week um, because I was finishing up the summer with my kids. My daughter was now a freshman. We were getting ready to move her into college. I literally had like five business days to get this, to go to California, get it photographed and come back. Um, And I worked hand in hand, you know, the hats off to the Wizard Palm Springs um, Tourism Board the PR agency, I just sent an email and I said, hey, this is commissioned and I, this is when it's due and these are the four days that I can be there. Can we make it happen? Mm-hmm. And literally, I think everybody just said, yes, let's do it. And we figured out a way to do it. So again, all these forces that were working behind, um, I don't know, it's just some, just, there's something there that was, you know, that was meant to be. Um, that's the second hurdle. <laughs> The mm-hmm. third hurdle was um, I missed both my flights. Um, oh, my so gosh. A four-hour, a four, four-and-a-half-hour um, commute time from Chicago to Palm Springs ended up being like a 12-hour day, both days, both times. And I was just nervous because I literally had one day to photograph. And this, I mean, they, they are a tribe that's um, heavily, you know, invested in, in their business. And, you know, considering that there are seven adults, it's not like, oh, we can't do it today. Okay, let's do it tomorrow. You know, mm-hmm. we just move everything. And, and mm-hmm. I didn't even want to do that because, you know, that was a huge ask, right? So we kind of made it work. We, you know, we we got me there. <laughs> and then the, what was it, fourth? The fifth hurdle was it was 115 degrees in the desert. Oh, God. Um, I'm not, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not used to this. I mean, yes, I'm from Mumbai and, you know, I've grown up in a humid environment, but the max I've gone to is maybe like 100. Mm-hmm. And this is by desert heat. So photographing in that heat and even being outside in that heat, forget mm-hmm. photographing, being outside in that heat was incredibly challenging, not just for me, but for them. And, mm-hmm. you know, even though they are, they live there, this is like, they're doing me a favor by mm-hmm. agreeing to kind of share their story and agreeing to be photographed. So I was very, I was very nervous. I, I had <laughs> extreme anxiety. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to photograph these women? And it's, you know, it's Palm Springs, it's beautiful, but it's when it's that hot, you don't see, it's like your mind just stops, right? You, you can't think creatively. Um, so I photographed them. I don't know. I just can I. One of the things that Amanda said to me was that, yeah, you know, this is. And she talked about her mom again, and that was that was actually coincidentally my mom's birthday as well. Oh wow! I just felt like all the women power was there to make me get the story like how I wanted, and for them to, you know, even them, they were so. They were so open. They were so mm-hmm. like sharing and caring about you know their story. And I was asking so many questions, and they were patiently answering me all like answering all my questions. And I just felt like collectively, it just it was meant to be. Um, and you know, you you thank you for complimenting me on the photographs because I know you're an incredible photographer. But it was really hard, and I just wanted I wanted to showcase their strength, and I mm-hmm. felt like 
like honestly the the photographs the portraits of the women with the feathers which if you read the story you'll know the meaning of the feathers mm. those are my favorite because yeah. it just ties their history to um an inanimate object but brings that object to life and brings them to life um so yeah all these elements sort of <laughs> you know came together and it's um i have to say it's one of my favorite stories for all the troubles that we've all gone through it just i'm so glad and it's apparently doing really well on mm. vogue so that's another you know kind of check mark i guess <laughs> that's a bonus for sure man now now you know you and i were just talking about this before we start recording how it's so interesting to hear the back story of the story now knowing the back story i am even more in awe of the story because what i've actually picked up in the images is the magic like they they really look almost ethereal almost yeah. you know and, and it's your style by the way i also recognize your style immediately in the images but now you know, I almost had goosebumps when you were talking about like all these hurdles that you had to overcome and how the day was so hard with the heat and everything. But it, it felt like really uh, the manifestation of of, uh, of the power of women coming together and doing something magical. Uh, wow, it's I, I can definitely see that in the images now. So that's that's really special. And the fact that it was your mom's birthday on that day, it's just like. You cannot make that stuff up, you know. You can, you cannot make that stuff up. Yeah, exactly. And I you know when I think back and as I was talking to you, I was just in my mind too. I was like, oh my god, we we all we all face so many challenges. Forget like personal work, right? Personal life in work, we we face so many challenges. But when we actually are able to get something to completion and to fruition, it's just a great feeling that you know I thought about something, I conceptualized something, mm -hmm. and here it is. I actually made it work. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this amazing story. It can be even the smallest of things. But I think that just is very powerful. Mm. And it goes back to your point about knowing the story, you know, knowing that backstory or knowing where it started from. And then, you know, you're able to kind of take it to completion. So I have a couple of questions um, okay. on this. One is, so you mentioned that, you know, you pitched it and pitched it and pitched it and it didn't go anywhere for so long. Man, how familiar I am with that as well. <laughs> what, keeps keeps you going? Going? what keeps you going in, in that, right? Because I've been at places where I'm just like, you know what, forget this. I'm not even going to pitch it. But then at some point later, I come back to it and I start pitching it again. So I'm curious, like, what what keeps you keep pitching it when you get a rejection after rejection after no response after no response yeah um so for me that's like twofold and um i will credit our common friend iona mm -hmm. Brennan, uh, for this the first piece um i remember a long time ago iona telling me that hey you know what stories come into our lives for a reason mm -hmm. You know, we get these stories, be it ideas, be it something we've read or so, that sparks, you know, something else. They come to our, to our, like they choose us for a mm -hmm. reason. And we can either ignore it or we can act on it. Mm -hmm. And the effort is in the action. Because I think that, I mean, this story is not new, right? I mean, these, these this tribe has been around for a very long time, um, you know, before when before the the second this, this current generation came back to the reservation, there was another generation. They had an, an equally amazing story. So this story has been alive and been there out in the universe for a long time. Mm -hmm. It chose, I feel, it chose me, um, mm -hmm. and I just felt very strongly about this about this piece. And there are several pieces. We all feel strongly about several several stories, right? And when I felt like I knew it was a good story because it mm -hmm. came from the heart and the fact that I met these people mm -hmm. um, and I heard from them. And so I was equally determined to say, hey, you know what? I want to I want to I want to give their voice um, a space. Mm -hmm. I want to give them a space to tell their story. And I've always believed that, like for me, the way I write and the way I kind of tell stories, it's not my my view. It's their view or it's mm -hmm. your view, it's the people who are from there, it's their perception. So I always like to pull myself out of the equation and tell the story, right? So mm -hmm. 
the fact that this story came to me, came into my life, um, I almost felt like I really wanted to tell this story. Hmm. And I just, I don't know, I just pushed, I just pushed myself. And even, even you know, the, the Vogue commission was not um, right off the bat. It, you know, I pitched it over, I think, spring. Um, and, you know, it took a while for it to mm-hmm. kind of sit and, I don't know how, you, like, germinate, I guess. Maybe that's the mm-hmm. word for it. Um, mm-hmm. Even with the editor, right? I mean, the fact that, you know, the editor came back and said, hey, you know what? I know you've pitched this a while back. Is it still available? And if so, mm-hmm. I want it. So even that that statement of his, like, is it still available? To me, in my mind, it's like, okay, so, you know, stories are around, are with us for a reason, and then they move on. If mm-hmm. I had not done anything with it, maybe it would have gone to somebody else, and they would right. have picked it. So I think if you think about it from that perspective, it really kind of makes you want to keep pushing it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not saying it's all fun and games and you know it's it doesn't hurt because it definitely hurts when you get an objection you're like oh my god you you know can can da- start doubting yourself mm-hmm. but i think that some narratives just you just you just have a gut feeling you just have that mm-hmm. you know intense emotion tied to that story and you push you, you hold on to that and you, you know, kind of push that forward that is so beautiful and by the way shout out to ayana because <laughs> what a wise friend we have like i love i love that piece of advice Yes, um, and I, have, I have kind of told her this too. I'm like, remember you told me all this? This is this is that story. Remember you said mm-hmm. this? This is this other story. So yeah. yeah, yeah. And we have an episode out with Ayana as well, which we're gonna link to to in the show notes. So you guys check it out as well. She she shares so much wisdom and knowledge um, in her episode as well. Um, so so I can relate to that too. And and I think that's such a beautiful way to think about stories. And, you know, we're almost like the guardians of the stories, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really love that. And the other question I had on this was, um, you mentioned something about you being almost like a vessel for the story. It's not your story, it's their story. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, um, people ask me, how do I tell a story of a community that I don't belong to? Or is this my story to tell? And I think this is something that we're all thinking about a lot. So what is your approach to that? Like, how do you think through that when you are, you know, telling stories of, of these communities or, or of these women, et cetera? Um, I mean, this, for me, it's really not a scientific approach. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for me, it's honestly... Um, it's it's a feeling, mm-hmm. you know. Some stories, some narratives. I just I just don't know enough. I'm not. Yeah. I don't have enough background, enough education, enough mm-hmm. knowledge to be confident that I'm going to tell that story. Mm-hmm. But you know, like for this story, there were so many other elements that I could draw parallels with with my life. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that you know their mom was such a big influence. My mom mm-hmm. was such a big influence. Mm-hmm. You know, their mom. Um, kind of you know didn't didn't pass in a in a peacefully i guess yeah. um it, so some of those things just for me fe- i felt that connection mm-hmm. and you know i was fairly confident that i could do a good job um and i just always tell myself that it's not me who's writing it's i'm writing through they're they're talking through my writing if yeah. that makes sense and so for me, that's that's sort of how I view it. Um, there, there have been a lot of instances where I've, you know, gotten an idea or a story and I'm like, that's a great story, but I don't, I just don't know enough. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know enough of the background and the history to really do a good job with it. And then I just let it go. Mm-hmm. Then that story, again, going back to, you know, that, that, that concept that the story chooses you. Mm-hmm. Yes, that story chose me, but I was not the right fit for it when you let it go it'll mm-hmm. find somebody else who is a better fit for it because it's mm-hmm. not, yes, it's, you know, we want the accolades, we want, you know, the Vogue byline and all of that stuff. But deep down, we all come into this business or do this thing because we want to tell stories. We want to tell these narratives, right? Mm-hmm. And if we do it, but don't do it right, I think that's a bigger burden to bear than to say, I'm just letting the story go because I know I'm not going to do it. Mm. Wow, that is such a beautiful. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's such a profound, uh, profound way to think about it. Um, I love it. And I resonate with it too, because that's also how I approach uh, approach finding stories as well. And, you know, you and I, we, we are on the same wavelength on a lot of things. So I, I absolutely resonate with it. I wonder, so sustainability or sustainable living is a topic that you explore in this piece and, and in a lot of uh, other work that you do as well. And I feel like sustainability has become one of those terms that has just been so overused that it's almost like losing its meaning. And when people read the word sustainable, it's kind of like their eyes glaze over, you know? There's a lot of other words like that. Community is another one. Right, right. So I wonder, as somebody who really dedicates a lot of your work towards writing about you know, sustainability as a topic, how do you ensure that it's a story that continues to resonate in this landscape where it's become such an overused word? And I, I don't know, I'm just really curious to hear how you think about that, because I, I think about that a lot when I, you know, pitch stories about community or, or people or whatever. And some of these terms, they're just become so overused. Yeah, I think, you know, um, and, and maybe this is kind of going a little bit against Maybe what you think I'm going to answer, but... Um, I have no idea what you're going to say, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't think it's overused. I think we oh, don't cool. use Interesting. it enough. Hmm. Um, I feel like, you know, if you shout, if you kind of say something as a, as a parent, maybe this is where I draw the parallel, as I tell my kids certain things over and over and over again, Yes, part of me feels like, why am I repeating this? But the one time that I know that they will pay attention makes it all worthwhile, hmm. which is why I kind of feel like it's not overused. It is, I mean, we need to kind of keep using this word because mm -hmm. the, these words, these community, this, you know, um, uh, authentic and, you know, all mm -hmm. these words. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. we as writers feel like, oh, maybe it's, you know, done to death and overused. But that one person who reads it, who is motivated and inspired and says, you know what, I'm going to look into a solar panel. Or you know what, I'm going to look at this, um, this small patch of my yard that, you know, I didn't know what to do. I'm going to try and grow some vegetables like this, this tribe of nine, you know, seven people are doing. It's all worth it. Mm -hmm. um, it's all worth it because collectively it makes a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. I have another story in in Thrillist about this um, person in India who has, uh, he's a, he's a landowner um, and he has, he has land, ancestral land in um, an area called Javai, which is full of leopards. And, um, you know, there's a that tourist element to it, but there's also a lot of community development and conservation that this one person is doing. And when I met him and he actually, you know, got his laptop out and he was, he's manually cataloging all these leopards. There is mm -hmm. no government oversight here. It's just him doing this, but that's making a difference. That's making a difference in his community. That's making a difference in his village. So no, I don't think we are overusing it. I, in, mm -hmm. in, in contrast, I feel like we're not using it as much. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is, there has to be, backing you can't just throw the word out and you know not have it resonate with what's the story or you know the backing to it but i feel like we need to tell more of these stories we need to tell these stories of these seven people this one person this you know uh, a thousand people community that's doing something because they're the true champions they don't care mm -hmm. about will i call this sustainable or will i call this you know <laughs> <laughs> they're just doing it because they feel it's the right thing to do and right. that, you know it's a difference in their lives and in the lives of the people around them why should we not use it that's such a beautiful way to look at it i love it such a such a hopeful way to look at it too which is yes which is and I, like i said earlier i mean i think it comes from you know maybe like being a parent right i mean you i have you know my husband and i we keep telling our kids the same things over and over and over again <laughs> Sometimes we look at each other and we're like, just, why don't we just shut up? But there is that hope that, you know, in the hundred times that I tell my daughter something, that one time she will actually listen and that will make an impact on her. Yeah. I'm going to keep saying it. 
That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So you mentioned India. Yes. Which is where you're from. You grew up in Mumbai. Um, how do you think growing up there has affected how you move through the world today? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because it's just so different. <laughs> um, I mean, life when I was in India, life was very, very different for me. Um, mm -hmm. I had, you know, Indian Indian community, Indian society, and it's probably it's still the case because that's Indian culture. Um, everybody is around you. Everybody's in your face. Everybody, and that's okay. You know, you, you have you have your mom and your dad, your neighbors are aunts and uncles, you have a gazillion cousins, everybody's coming <laughs> over. It's just such a collective community. Mm -hmm. um, and we know we don't live in these individual homes where you don't, very rarely, I mean, there are some people who do, but in, in Bombay, that's very, very rare. So I grew up in a building, uh, in an apartment building that had about 20 other flats. Um, I, you know, the doors were always open. It was just, I was having food somewhere else and, you know, somebody else coming over. So it was just very communal feeling. Mm -hmm. And I will admit when I first came here to the U.S., it was such a shock because that's not how life is here. Yeah. <laughs> um, you barely see your neighbors. You have no idea who they are. Um, nobody makes an effort. And I, and I don't mean it in a bad way. I just, you know, every, for whatever reason, right, it's not... It's not something that's innate. It's not something that's maybe kind of second nature, maybe. Mm. Um, so it was really hard. And um, for me, just going through, going to, like I've now spent half my life in India, almost more than half my life here. So it's definitely a struggle because I've, you know, wherever you are, you kind of absorb that culture. You, you, you know, kind of, it sort of finds itself in your life. So I... I'm becoming more, I find myself becoming more of an introvert because <laughs> I'm used to not talking to anyone. And when I go back home to India, it's like, what do you want to do? <laughs> no, I don't. I just want to stay back. I just want to stay at home. Um, so it's always a struggle. But um, I think it's just different. It's just a different way of life. And I don't know if, you know, maybe initially it's some part of that I carried forward to my life here. But now my life here is very different from my life, what was my life there. Um, I just try and adjust myself. Like when I go back, I, you know, I, I can tell myself that this is, this is what I grew up with. This is, you know, this is a big part of who I am. So rather than suppress that, I kind of let that part of me out. <laughs> mm -hmm. more. Um, and then when I come back, it's like this part of me comes mm -hmm. out. So I think it's just, I think, you know, every part of the world is so different. Every culture is so different. And if we can take a little bit of it and make it our own and just go through life, I think that's we're such, I think we're better people that way rather than sticking to one way. This is the way I, you know, I grew up this, this way in Bombay. And if it doesn't fit in the realm of my existence here, I shouldn't force it because that just makes me uncomfortable and people around me uncomfortable. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm only rambling at this point. No, <laughs> no, it makes sense. And it's funny that you bring this up, actually, because this is a conversation that I see popping up a lot in, in various spaces these days. Uh, in fact, I just recently listened to a podcast uh, episode of the Ezra Klein show, which I, we're going to link to that particular episode, which... Um, Ezra Klein, he's a, currently a New York Times journalist, and he has this podcast. And um, he had a, I think, a social, a social scientist on uh, okay. the podcast, and they were talking about this construct of single family home in the United States and what it has done to the fabric of our society and how it is such a recent invention in the millennia long history of how humans live. Yeah. You know, because the single family home idea only came in the fifties after the war, because, you know, people suddenly became more prosperous. Suddenly, uh, you know, uh, the government needed to build more, build, build, build. And so they were starting building these fam, you know, homes for literally one family. And before that, it was never the case, even in the States, which I, I found interesting and, and surprising. So, 
it's just, a, it was such a fascinating podcast. If you guys are interested in this topic, definitely check it out too, because it talks a lot about how it is for humans, it is not um, natural to yeah. live in that isolation. Yeah. And a and lot of see- the things that we're struggling with, like that loneliness epidemic, um, the mental health crisis in the States comes from that. The fact that we don't have a support network as robust as in some of these other places. And I'm not saying that other places aren't, you know, dealing with loneliness or mental health challenges or not, but at least they have, if assuming that their society isn't becoming more westernized in the way they live, they have the support tool of of having that community and, and, and people around them in a way that we just don't in the U.S. I mean, it's just a fascinating conversation, I think. It is. It is. And, you know, you, as you were talking, I was just thinking about, you know, experiences growing up where, um, you know, my parents both worked and there were times when, you know, they would be late and it was never a fear of, where is Karthik going to be, or where is my where is my sister going to be? It was just assumed that the neighbor would kind of, you know, we would knock on the door. If nobody answered the door, we would go knock on a neighbor's door, and she'd be like, "Yeah, come in, just hang out." And then my parent, my mom would come, or my dad would come, and it would be fine. Mm-hmm. And now, as a parent, I'm like, okay, like when I was working, it was like, oh, three o'clock. I need to like go. I need to like because I have to drive an hour. Right. And I have to pick up my kids from daycare because I'm doing everything me myself and I. Right. And it's just like, you know, not that, not to say that somebody wouldn't have helped if I asked, but that ask is not mm-hmm. natural. That ask it's is not normalized. Normal. Yeah. It's not normalized. Exactly. So you feel odd. You feel like, okay, why am I, why am I burdening somebody else? You know, mm-hmm. I should be able to figure this out. Um, and if I can't figure it out, I'm depressed. I'm, you know, I'm upset. And eventually I quit because, because I, you know, I couldn't do everything right Mm. so it's it's again not to say that that is the crux of what's wrong but that's definitely a factor in how we move through life Mm. yeah tell us more about mumbai itself what was it like living there i've so for so long wanted to go there and just experience the city how what is it like it's, you know, um, Mumbai is, and I keep well refer it to as Bombay because when I was growing up, it was Bombay. I know officially the names changed to Mumbai, but um, it's called the city of dreams. And mm-hmm. there's a reason for it because um, there's a lot of migrant population that comes in. It's the financial, you know, financial capital of India. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, got Bollywood. It's got, so it's got the movie industry. It's got, mm-hmm. you know, the financial industry. So a lot of people from all over India come to Bombay because they want to fulfill their dreams. They feel mm-hmm. like it's a place where anything can happen. Mm-hmm. You, you know, there have been stories of um, really like, you know, uh, people who have had a very difficult time in life um, coming and getting a big break in the movies and you know making it big. So you have all these aspirational, inspirational stories. So a lot of people come to Bombay. And I think that's what's the beauty of the city. Yes, traffic is a nightmare. (laughs) Yes, you will find people everywhere you turn. And I know a lot of times, like um, when I used to take trips, when I used to take people on trips to India, they would always say, oh, but it's so loud. Oh my God, Mm. there's so many people. And I'm like, yes, (laughs) it's a country of a billion people. You are going to find people everywhere. You just have to accept it that it's a, it's Mm. a fact of life. But if you accept that, I think there's something so beautiful because you will meet mm-hmm. people from all walks of life. You will meet people who are multimillionaires, who have huge apartments, and then you will meet somebody who has nothing. Mm-hmm. And just, I think those experiences, those stories that you, be, that you experience, that you kind of absorb, really will help you experience India a lot better. Um, it is not, it's not, anything that you will find here <laughs> i know there's a lot of comparison between bombay and new york and yes i get it but it's just very different mm-hmm. um you know i love going back i love going back because i still have family there i have some very good friends there and that's where i grew up so you know my memories my childhood memories are associated with with uh, bombay and with india so mm-hmm. for me it's always going to be home 
Uh, <laughs> yes, homes changed. A lot of things, you know, are different. But I think if you're up for an adventure and, you know, you want you want to meet people, you want to know these stories, um, it is the place. It is the place to go. For sure. I hope I can go there with you one day because yes. that would be amazing. <laughs> I know um, we've talked about this. I mean, you know, the food just... Oh. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've never felt more alive anywhere in the world than when I was in India. Yes. It is just, I don't know, you feel exhilarating all the time. Yes, and, and you know, because so there's incredible. so much energy, right? Mm. Not, just, not just the people. I think the people cause the vibrations and the energy around, mm. you, know, around you. So, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not saying this is true everywhere in India, but like in Bombay, 2 o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to be the only one on the street. There are, and there are mm-hmm. people going to be out and about doing, you know, doing things. Um, the flower markets. I know this is another story that you know came out um, recently in uh, Malaysian Airlines Going Places magazine. Mm-hmm. I talk about India's flower markets. Like Bombay has an amazing flower market. You go at two, three o'clock in the morning. There's like wheeling, dealing, and there's you know flowers of all colors wow. and shapes. And that just for you, that just wakes you up. You know, you mm-hmm. have this this psychedelic view in front of you you don't know where to look you're like should I look at this guy who's you know kind of selling roses or should I look at this person who's selling jasmine and it's just so much energy that you you can't help but absorb some of that in I love that I love that and I yeah it's it's when you were talking about that market I thought about the the Tokyo's fish market it's like the iconic place in Tokyo and sounds like this is the one of the, those iconic places to be in you know in- it's not the funny thing is it's not an iconic place in the sense that if you look at most guidebooks and stuff like that they will not talk about going to a flower market or a vegetable market um but it's just one of those things that you have to experience just because it's so different from going to a museum Mm -hmm. or you know going to like the gateway of india or going to like the taj hotel it's very different it's just Mm -hmm. more normal people things Mm -hmm. Um, i think that's such a great way to experience a place you yeah. guys are getting an insider information right here. Go to the <laughs> flower market in, in Mumbai when you're there. <laughs> Definitely. And every city has, you know, every city has something, right? I mean, there's like Tokyo's fish market. I mean, it, it, start, it didn't start off as a tourist attraction. It was mm-hmm. just normal people going about their day buying mm-hmm. fish. Um, right. The same thing. I mean, you know, the flower market or the vegetable market, or you go to, you know, a shopping mall. And it's just normal people doing everyday mm-hmm. things. And I think yeah. from that's, at least that's the way I like to travel. Yeah. You know, is, there yes. one, is there one flower market or multiple or like what's the name if people wanted to go there? Um, How do they so find there, is, there is the Dadar flower market, which is, I believe, the oldest flower market in Bombay. Mm-hmm. But Bombay is such a, you know, it's grown so much in terms of just expanding and expanding and reclaiming land. I think there are about like five or six wow. um, because it's, you know, the population is so spread out. Not everybody can come, you know, from two hours away just to mm. dollar. So depending on where you are, um, just Google flower market and you will find. <laughs> <laughs> Google help you. I love it. Yeah. So we share another. Um, in addition to both being in the industry and becoming really good friends, um, we were really fortunate, I think, to have been to one of my favorite places on earth together yes um recently which is you guys already know what this place is i talk about it all the time of course it's jordan and so couple couple one one or two years ago oh my god has it already been two years yeah 2021 november 2021 yeah two years ago kartika and i um we're in Jordan together and um, I got to travel to Wadiram with Kartika and her family. And it was just one of the most beautiful experiences. And I wonder um, how have you felt particularly about visiting Petra? Because in one of your articles, you talk about that you first learned about Petra through going and uh, watching the Indiana Jones movie with your mom. 
Um, so you had, you know, you had a special memory about this place without, without ever seeing it. So how did it, how did it uh, make you feel when you actually went there and, and, and brought your own family now to Petra? It was um, phenomenal. And- I mean, you know, again, this was the first Indiana Jones movie was like what 1980s. Um, mm-hmm. My mom was a huge adventure. She loved, loved, loved traveling. Um, and so we, we, I remember seeing this movie and, you know, the last scene where he's riding through from the treasury, it just mm-hmm. stuck with me. And it was just such an iconic part of Petra. Mm-hmm. And thanks to you, <laughs> we got to do Petra in a very different way, I think. And mm-hmm. I really appreciated that because, you know, going through the back entrance and, and you know, hiking. And again, it's, it was something that as a family, we love to do. We mm-hmm. love to kind of hike and we camp and we do all that so kind of experiencing this magical place but experiencing it my way Mm -hmm. I think for me that just really solidified it as you know a lifetime a goal of a lifetime right Mm -hmm. because if I had done what every other tourist does and just you know go to the treasury yeah it would be spectacular I would you know I definitely have been it would have been a wow moment but the fact that we got this sort of back back view, mm-hmm. um, and our guide was so amazing, and he you know, mm-hmm. he shared the history of the place, and he you know he shared his his experiences, his knowledge, his life living there. I think all of that just made it that much more relatable. Mm-hmm. So when I did see that you know that glimpse of the treasury, and I you know did have the memory of you know kind of being in that theater with my mom. I had my kids with me, my husband with me. It was just, it was such a came full circle, I guess, is what I want to what I want to use. Um, but full circle in a way that made sense um, mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. So it just, you know, it's just that that experience, such and such experiences, kind of live with you forever. Mm-hmm. Um, Annika, my daughter, still, she still talks about, you know, kind of Wadi Ram and, you know, really? Meeting, oh, that makes me yeah. so happy. That makes Absolutely. me so happy. Meeting, uh, meeting, you know, Emma and, you know, the team at, at uh, the Bedouin camp. Those are memories that, you know, my kids are, are will have for their lives. Again, mm-hmm. because we did it in a way that was very relatable to how mm-hmm. you travel in general. Um, so I think that kind of, you know, really helps kind of put that memory, ingrain that memory deep in your brain yeah. because you can associate with it in, on so many levels. It's not just one instance that you have a connection. You have a, multiple layers of connection to that story. I will never forget how we were sitting on the floor at Fala's house. Remember when Fala invited us over to have lunch with him and the family and we're all yes. spread out and we're all eating Oh my God, yes. what, was, what did we have? Was it mansaf? Or, no, I don't remember what it was. It was rice, rice pilaf something. Yes, and it was um, like then, it was in that plate and everybody was kind of sharing from that plate, right? Mm-hmm. And again, mm-hmm. we would go to a hotel. I mean, we stayed in a hotel in Petra. Um, that's not the experience that we had. We were still the four of us, four of us at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. But then this lunch was with the whole family, mm-hmm. which was so special. Mm-hmm. Sticks, sticks with you. You ask me what you know. What was the dining room of the Marriott in Petra? <laughs> but you ask me what was you know what was the living room uh, where you ate like? And I can if I close my eyes, I just I have that vision right there. Yeah, me. me too. And I can tell you the color of the couch. I can tell you where we were sitting, and those things because it just was an experience that was very again relatable to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, oh my God, what am I doing here? It was like, wow, mm-hmm. I believe I'm here. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. it was so well, beautiful. Okay. You know, there are so many misconceptions about uh, this region. And so I wonder, was there anything that you encountered in Jordan that perhaps surprised you or perhaps... Um, something that you saw in a different way. Just talk to me a little bit about that part of it, because it's the Middle East, you know, yes. and the Middle East is the region that um... <laughs> I agree. I, you know, I, I know exactly where you're going and I'll tell you my, um, and, and this is something we've talked about as well as a, as a family. Before going to, uh, before doing Jordan, 
And honestly, I did Jordan because of you, right? I mean, the, the stories that you've told, the experiences you've shared with me, I was like, wow, that seems like a really nice place. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's the Middle East. I we have we have never prior to Jordan. We and in fact after Jordan too, we've never been back to the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was again, there was this. I don't want to say preconceived notions, but there was what we were seeing, what we were mm-hmm. hearing, mm-hmm. what we were reading mm-hmm. um, that, yes. you know, gave us a view of, okay, is, should we do this? Is it mm-hmm. safe? Is it, mm-hmm. is it, will we be, will we have a good experience there? And the, the thing that really I kept pushing was that, yes, we will, because we know this person who shares similar values as us, who is there who is who has done this multiple times who talks about all these wonderful experiences as an outsider mm-hmm. i'm sure that we will have a great time mm-hmm. and you know when we landed and when we met um i forget his name our our wonderful driver uh, not driver mm-hmm. guy basil basil yes we <laughs> met basil and he just again it was he was so warm and you know welcoming and and it just it was comforting to know mm-hmm. that you know, he as he's a, he's a dad. You know, he's a husband. He's you know he's from there. He's he, he's shared his life experiences. So knowing that at the end of the day, we're all the same. You know, we mm-hmm. we may live in a different place. We may look different. We might you know the color of our skin might be different. We might speak different languages, but we all want the same thing, right? I mean, we all want a good life, to be healthy to see our families, you know, kind of succeed and, and, you know, be happy. None of that changes just because you live in the Middle East or you live in Chicago or you live in Tokyo. Um, And I think that just, you have to go with that mindset because otherwise it's just, you never step out of what you know and what you, what is in your immediate circle. And it's such a beautiful world outside of that circle. Um, so I'm so glad we went because apart from what you see in the news and what you hear in the news, when you're there and you meet people who live there and you hear their stories, you realize that, again, like I said, I don't want to kind of say the same thing again, but it's just you in a different form. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I that. Exactly what, what your life is like is in a, in a different you know in a different part of the world mm. um, I'm, I'm really glad we went and I'm really glad I took my kids there too because again you know for them it was eye-opening to the fact that you know he talked about his children you know we met we met um, some of the other kids there and it was just it was just a great feeling to be mm. in a place that's mm. so misunderstood um, for whatever it, you know whatever the reasons I don't you know I'm not going to justify whether that's right or wrong, but it's just that, you know, being there just opened our eyes to the fact that these are people just like you and me. So you mentioned people a couple of times, and it just makes me so happy because this is exactly what I've kind of dedicated my my work in a lot of ways is, is to bringing stories of people to mm-hmm. the forefront and I think you you as well you know this is something that that drives you as well but it's, especially in places like the Middle East this is exactly the journey that happens that until we connect to a specific person there we just have this vague concept of a place the Middle East yeah but once we know Basso the driver and how wonderful he is all of a sudden it becomes something different you know and that's I think the journey and that's why it motivates me so much to keep bringing stories of, of people uh, yeah. from, from all these different places. And I think for you as well, right? So you're a travel photographer, amazing photographer, you're a writer, you're a storyteller, you've been working with a variety of publications. We mentioned Vogue, we mentioned uh, Afar, uh, Condé Nast, a couple of uh, many others. And by the way, we'll link to Kartika's work in the show notes too, so you guys check it out. But tell me more about this passion of yours uh, to bring those cultural narratives to the forefront, right? What, what's, um, why is that the thing that you've chosen as, as the lens through which you kind of take all your work uh, and bring it to the world? I think it's like, you know, a few different uh, 
few different reasons, right? I mean, um, I did not, this is not what I went to school for. This is mm-hmm. not what I started my career as. Um, you know, I have an IT background and I, um, I I worked in corporate for a long time. And for a while, that was just who my persona was. Mm-hmm. Um, but now when I, you know, when I meet people, I want them to know my story. I want them to know who I am, where I come from, what I've been doing, what I'm doing now, what I will do in the future. And I think that if you focus on the people and you mm-hmm. focus on their stories, you have a stronger connection. Um I, you know, when, when somebody tells me, okay, like you asked me, tell me about Bombay, tell me about India, like, you know, your life. I want to tell you my story, right? I don't want to mm-hmm. tell you, yes, I started off with the fact that Bombay is an amazing place, but, you know, I, can, I hope I kind of drove the point that it's the people. The, mm-hmm. you know, there are a lot of people and you know, they have such amazing stories and they have these beautiful dreams that they come for. So for me, it's again, always the people. Mm-hmm. And everywhere I go, if I don't, like I, I, try as much as possible to try and connect with the people on the ground, whether it's going to a local cafe, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, finding a tour to a, a, somebody who's, who's from there, who's talking about, you know, a museum, but from their lens. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, for me, it's sort of, it's great to hear those narratives because I feel like those are much stronger narratives mm-hmm. of a place um, with, the people who live there and so much of it also comes from you know India for the longest time people had this vision of India as you know people starving on the streets and you know kids you know kind of working in slums and and yes that's not to say that that doesn't exist Mm -hmm. but there are also other really happy stories that come out of India Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote about this women's collective in Jaipur which is a you know highly touristy city but nobody talks about these little collectives that are doing amazing things for these women in terms of giving them financial stability and freedom and if I had not gone there if I had not you know gone and visited them and sat down with them and heard their story I wouldn't know I would still just go to Hava Mahal or you know <laughs> go to the, 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 the things that Jaipur is famous for mm-hmm. um, I feel like we need to tell these stories and it's you know, when, when you and I and whoever else, you know, kind of talk about their lives, we sort of light up, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we light up because we are so happy sharing a small part of our lives with this other person who's asked the question. Um, tell, me about, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about, you know, your life in Bombay. Tell me about Estonia. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I want to know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious in the sense that not because I want to make you feel uncomfortable, but I'm curious because I want to try and find a connection with mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. so that I can, you are more relatable to me. And when you become more relatable to me, mm-hmm. that, that friendship grows, right? Mm-hmm. So that's sort of always been my thing that, you know, if I'm going somewhere or if I'm meeting somebody, I want to know. I want to know a little bit of their lives so I can draw parallels mm-hmm. and I can, yes, I understand now what you mean by that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause I went through something similar. Um, and I think that sort of feeds my, my drive for telling these stories because a, a place is just a place. It's just buildings and, you know, brick walls and things like that. I think what makes it interesting are the people, their stories, they are, interactions you know the foods the the the, the clothes the, the cultural element the temples or the mosques or whatever it is that's what makes it interesting mm-hmm. otherwise it's just a place. <laughs> oh my god i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more that's that's exactly how i feel that people the people it's the people that make travel so special and so exhilarating and beautiful and um i think you and i also share this other uh, characteristic, which is curiosity about the world, you mm-hmm. know, how, like we were just talking before we started recording, how wide the world is, how, how, how many interesting and beautiful places they are that are so different, uh, from each other. And it's that, it's that urge to, to learn more about them and to, to learn more about the people and to discover in the end that while the places are different, the people, are fundamentally all wanting the same things. I think right. it's just such a such a powerful belief and, and, a, and a mission to be on 
to, and to it's, keep you know, honestly that. it's easier too i feel like now mm. um, I mean, there's so many uh, ways that you can interact with um, local communities and and, and people um, it, there shouldn't be an excuse to say oh i did not find the information or i did not know where to look and i think when you like when you you know, people like you and me kind of focus on these stories and these these stories are, about people are published, that's another avenue for others to get information, right? Mm-hmm. Now you go to Palm Springs, maybe you will drive to, because they have a farm. Mm-hmm. They sell produce in the farm and they have classes, educational classes in the farm. So maybe if you have time, you will, you know, remember the story and you will actually go there and you will do that. Or you will go to Wadi Ram and instead of staying in, you know, a bubble tent, <laughs> Hotel, you will you will stay at um, at the, the Bedouin camp, and you will learn mm-hmm. a little bit about them because Yulia wrote about them, or you mm-hmm. know, kind of we talked about this, right? So I think there's so there's there's information, a lot more information now, and access to that information is also so much easier now mm-hmm. that you shouldn't you shouldn't there shouldn't be any barriers for you to experience mm-hmm. a place in a more richer way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. What I've been thinking a lot lately, though, is that the flip side of that is that there's often like too much information. You don't even know what's real and what's not. What's you know what's a trust? I feel like so many people are so o- overwhelmed um, in making some of these choices. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but th- that's when I f- I feel like going back to what you said earlier, which is that connect with somebody who is from there connect with somebody who knows right who is uh who is a local or who is part of the local community uh and that's how you're going to be able to 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 realize that a bedouin camp is the way to go you know right um and some of that no it's um it's fascinating and honestly kartika you're helping me right now a little bit to see our roles in a, even a new light, I would say. Mm-hmm. Because that idea of us spreading that information and helping somebody make that decision, maybe a better informed decision, honestly, I haven't thought about it in that way too much in the past. So thank you. I actually appreciate it. I'm going <laughs> to take it on. I'm going to take it forward for, uh, go, uh, with me because that's, that's a really beautiful way to put it. No, and, you know, and maybe it's, because I'm in this space, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because now when I when I when I'm looking at a new place, you know, I look at I look at my friends, I look at their portfolios, I look at, you know, have they been there? Have they have do they know someone? And I feel like social media for whatever it's whatever it's bad things are and there are a lot. Um, it's also there's a lot of good um, mm-hmm. you know reaching out to somebody and saying, hey, I'm, you know, I, I see you're from here or I see you've written this or, you know, I see you going there. Do you have any recommendations? Do you, do you, do you know somebody who I can connect with because I want to get more information? Mm-hmm. Um, I was on an Arctic cruise over the summer with my daughter and I'm, I just happened to go on the ship's Instagram and I saw that there was another um, uh, writer, photographer who was on a previous um, mm. cruise with with Aurora, and I just messaged her and I said, "Hey, I'm do, you know doing this a month from now, um, and and this was my first cruise, so I was like, any advice? You know, how is the ship like and and stuff like that? Just simple questions, and she gave me so much information, um, helpful information that you know I feel like I really benefited from that conversation. So, mm-hmm. am I saying everybody is going to respond to you? Probably not." But that shouldn't stop you from reaching out and saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking or I'm interested. Can you point me in the right direction? Or do you know someone who would be willing to talk? Mm-hmm. It's incredible how many people are willing to help if you just ask. Mm. I love I that. That's, that's, my, that's my experience has been. <laughs> I love um, that. Again, it goes back to the whole, you know, people are what make a place beautiful. Yeah. And, and even to what we said earlier about, you know, how community mm-hmm. is, a, is a support mechanism that we have and reaching out and asking for help, which may yeah. feel like a burden in some scenarios, but actually more, more often than not, people are willing to help. And it even ties back to pitching. 
Yeah. You know, and, and even though you might not get a response or even though you might get a rejection, somebody at some point will say yes. Yes. And yes. give your story an avenue to, to be published. So it's interesting, just so many parallels to the whole conversation that we had today. <laughs> Which I absolutely love. And that's why I love talking to you, Kartik. I find that our conversations are always um, really soul nourishing, you know. So. Yes, I know we start off with one thing and then we kind of <laughs> go across, across the room to something completely different and eventually get back. But mm. yes, likewise, my friend. So I think we're going to start closing, uh, even though I don't know how this hour has passed already. Uh, we know. just started talking. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you one final question, and that is, you know, you've mentioned a couple of things that you've done uh, recently. You've been on an Arctic cruise with your daughter. You went and produced this incredible um, story of one of the smallest nations in California and what they're doing. You know, you've been to Jordan. You've been to so many places over the past few years. What would you say brings you the most joy and delight in your life right now? Um, so my kids are older now. Um, I have one out of the house already um, and one's in high school. And for me, honestly, it's always been sharing this journey with them. Mm -hmm. um, I love traveling with them. Yes, they can be an absolute pain at times, mm -hmm. but I love traveling with them. Uh, I'm not a solo traveler. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't do well in big groups, but I don't do well in, in just by myself. For me, ideally, is ex sharing that experience with somebody who really matters to me or people who matter to me. So for me, it's been this journey has been so much more fulfilling in um, this, those experiences where I've been able to kind of share it with them or share it with a good friend, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel like um, I gain a lot more in terms of my experience um my daughter on the cruise um she's very much a social butterfly and she was and it was a small cruise it was just 38 38 of us but i swear i think the second day nanika knew everybody's name <laughs> and she was having a conversation with everybody and she forced me to you know she's like okay we, the, the the two weeks that we are on this cruise we are not going to eat by ourselves we are going to try and eat with everybody at least a couple of times and, you know, I love that, um, that idea. And so mm -hmm. for me, I want to try and, you know, I learned something from her on that cruise mm -hmm. where, I was like, you know, yes, I, I talk about it being about people, but sometimes, you know, we kind of don't want to take that first step. We, mm -hmm. especially, you know, introverts like mm -hmm. me, it just, it takes a little bit for me to kind of open up and, you know, kind of share with someone. And so, but she was just like, boom she's out she's like making all these friends and she had friends like I think the oldest person was like 75 years old and she's chatting with him and she's talking to him and it was such a beautiful thing to see mm -hmm. um, so I learned something from from them from my family every time we travel so I love traveling with them <laughs> and as someone who's traveled with your family too I can attest to the fact that it is so fun your family is so fun and i had so much fun with you guys and um i hope that you have lots more opportunities to do that uh, with your family and with the people you love um, yes in the future um, yes i know i hope so too um you know especially with one out of the house it's it's definitely challenging but um yeah i think it's just like for me, the, the kind of traveler that I am and the kind of person that, you know, I aspire to be, I, I want to have those experiences with someone because I feel I learn so much more from, mm -hmm. from the person, you know, as long as the connection is there. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't and know that's, that's why we travel at the end of the day, to learn something, to expand our horizons, to, to really make our life a more interesting journey on this on this planet so yes for sure i still remember my first press trip i still remember the friends i made as the experiences i had because it was a pleasant you know it was a really good experience mm -hmm. i still remember the first time i traveled with my kids um you know first first few of the um 
travel experiences that we had, like I had with my family, my parents. I remember those things. So I think, you know, the the more we kind of do some of these things that are enriching for us, whatever that means for you. Um, I think at the end of the day, when you think back, you have good memories. So like mm -hmm. you said, that's what that is all about. Awesome. Well, Kartika, thank you so much. Another yeah, beautiful conversation. Uh, let's now wait seven, eight seasons to, to have another catch up. Um, yeah. I really loved uh, what we, the distances we covered today. We traveled to India, we traveled to Jordan together. We, we touched on some really important topics. So I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you again somewhere fabulous in the world. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Julia. This is amazing.